Um, I'm George Robb. I'm on the board of the Newark History Society, and I'd like to welcome uh, you all to Newark After Dark, our second uh, presentation for the Newark History Society of our new fall season. Uh, before I uh, introduce our speaker, I'd like to point out to everyone at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A uh, function. And so during uh, tonight's talk, as questions occur to you, um, if you have uh, anything you'd like to ask the speaker, then um, you know, type them in, um, type them in the Q&A uh, box and I can read them out uh, at the end of, of um, the end of the talk, all right? So um, we are very happy to have uh, Whitney Strube as our speaker tonight. Uh, Whitney is an associate professor of history at Rutgers University, Newark. He is the author of several books, uh, for example, Perversion for Profit, The Politics of Pornography and the Rise of the New Right, which was published in 2011, um, and Obscenity Rules, Roth versus United States and the Long Struggle over Sexual Expression from 2013. Uh, he is uh, the co-editor of Porno Chic and the Sex Wars, American Sexual Representation in the 1970s, uh, which was published in 2016. His work has appeared in such venues as the Washington Post, Slate, Salon, Vice, and Temple of Schlock, as well as scholarly journals, including the Journal of the History of Sexuality, Radical History Review, Porn Studies, and American Quarterly. He lives in Newark, where he co-directs the Queer Newark Oral History Project. All right, um, I will turn it over to you, Whit, and we'll talk to everyone afterwards. Awesome. Um, thanks so much, George, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, well, I wanted to say a quick word of thanks, and then I'll launch right into it with one little minor disruption that I kind of forgot about. But um, I, I really want to thank Tim Christ and, and Gail Momgreen at the Newark History Society for recognizing the value of the history of sexuality and, and integrating this into the Newark History Society's programming. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a member of the Newark History Society. I urge you all to become members too. Um, and it's a real honor here to walk in the footsteps of so many great presentations that I've attended over the, the many years of my time here in Newark. Um, and I also wanna thank everybody at NJPAC for hosting this event and making it possible, as well as my friends and colleagues at the Queer Newark Oral History Project, which um, as we'll come back to over the talk undergirds a fair amount of this research. I, I wanna say one quick word um, just about tech stuff. We are in a state of emergency here in New Jersey and I'm hoping that doesn't knock out my Wi-Fi, but um, if anything, if, if I start to get glitchy or anything, I've got my hotspot on my phone ready as backup. So hopefully that won't be a problem, but we are in sort of extreme weather conditions. Um, and then one final thing, and then I'll launch right in. I do have to take the screen share down here for one second. Sorry about this. I, um, I want to make the slides that I'm gonna use available um, to everyone so that if uh, I go over anything too quickly, because I'm gonna be rushing through um, a fair amount of uh, visual material here, some of it with words on it. Um, this way everybody has access to it. So bear with me one second here, if you will. Um, in the chat, I just dropped a link that should take you to the, um, to the slides that I'm about to show so uh, that you can consult them if I move too quickly. Uh, and that being said, let me pull that back up and I will launch right in. Um, here we go. And slideshow. All right, fairly smooth. Um, yeah, so, you know, tonight I'm going to be talking about, uh, as the subtitle suggests, sex work, gay bars, porn theaters, and the archives of illicit sexuality. Um, one quick word uh, before I launch into a, a fairly narrative um, talk that, that I think I just want to cover some ground and, and lay down some history in Newark that doesn't get a lot of attention. But before launching into that, why is this topic important? You know, I don't want this to be misunderstood as some kind of sensationalistic or, or voyeuristic or, or prurient, um, you know, exercise in gawking. I think this is extremely important history. Um, and I, I think it carries a lot of historical significance and weight. And, you know, when I think about the inherent worth and dignity of marginalized groups in Newark, you know, I think back to um, the migration of radical German immigrants in the 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1840s and 50s. I think about the working class Jewish immigrants who followed them. I think about the African-American great migration that brought black power to Newark and changed the politics of this city forever. Um, 
But I think it's important too to think about marginalized sex cultures when we think about that history of marginalized and oppressed groups. Um, you know, I think particularly about LGBTQ history, something that had not historically received a lot of attention in Newark until recent decades. But I, I also think about sex work, which needs to be part of our labor history. Uh, when we think about labor history in Newark, it runs through controversial teachers' strikes of the 1970s, uh, CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, picketing workplaces in the 1960s for racial integration, all the way back to radical politics of the 19th century um, and Seth Boyden and the Industrial Revolution. But, you know, that, that labor history of Newark, which figures so prominently in our tellings, you know, I think does need to include things like sex work and recognizing that as labor, as part of labor history. And because if we believe that intersectionality is important, and I do believe that, and I hope you do as well, that also means that race, class, and gender and sexuality, as well as other categories, need to be central to our historical analysis. And, and one more case I would make here for the importance of the story before I dive in is, is just that it reveals a lot about the values of our society that the state committed so many resources, as we'll see, to destroying uh, queer life in Newark, destroying sex workers' lives, criminalizing them. Um, and that's an historical legacy that carries into the 21st century, which is the note I hope to reach and conclude on. Um, and so if we really wanna be serious about thinking how power operates historically, we need to think about things like its relentless deployment against sex cultures that fell outside of the patriarchal nuclear family historically. There, there's something really fundamental about how we organize our society that I think is, is revealed here because we can really only understand so-called normalcy when we position it against the enormous social violence that's been inflicted against those people who have fallen outside of it. Uh, outside of the so-called normal. And, and that's what I wanna highlight tonight. And so when we step into this history, there are different points of entry, I think, but the, the one I'd probably begin with is a really fascinating and revealing report on the social evil conditions of Newark, New Jersey in 1913 and 1914 that was written by uh, anti-vice investigators. Now we can see glimpses of underground sex cultures before this, for instance, um, Anthony Comstock, if any of my current students are on the call, they, they will know him well because I've been forcing them to read uh, his work of the late 19th century, such books as Traps for the Young. He was the pioneering anti-pornography and anti-vice crusader of the late 19th century um, and a really important figure behind the first federal obscenity law that was really important, the, the Comstock Act of 1873. But for our purposes, it's worth noting that he was based in New York City but he did come into Newark periodically. And in fact, in the late 19th century, he came here to arrest a man named Charles, Charles Conroy, who uh, as reporters of the time documented, lunged desperately at him with a knife, tore Comstock's face open and slashed through four facial arteries, leaving a deep scar several inches long running across Anthony Comstock's cheek, which also gives us a sense of the, uh, the sort of feistiness of um, you know, some Newark underworld cultures. The first archival document that I could find in Newark's history um, related to obscenity or pornography or, or sex culture really was um, a couple of letters from 1894 from the Christian Citizenship Union, which were demanding action from the city government uh, in light of recent exhibitions of obscene pictures on billboards and other public places in the city. Now, I don't know much more about it than that. It's, it's a couple of documents that are just sitting here in a box in the Newark City Archives, which I would never have discovered without Gail Malmgreen's work at the Newark Archives Project, making things like this discoverable through um, a really amazing historical database. So, so those are some glimpses of, you know, both a pornographic underworld and also uh, anti-vice uh, uh, activists in Newark in the 1890s. But again, it's really this report in 1913 that gives us a first really rich and deep window into the history of sex work in Newark. Um, so like I said, this is a report by anti-vice crusaders. They want to eradicate prostitution. They think it's a social evil, uh, a social blight and, and an immoral condition. And so these are not supporters or allies of sex workers, but what they do is surveil sex work relentlessly and thereby create a, a rich archive that can tell us uh, a great deal about the social conditions of women's lives who were engaged in sex work in Newark. Now, you know, it's written by uh, a conservative force that's trying to destroy this labor sector. And so we always need to be aware of that and read against the grain. But nonetheless, there's, there's a fair amount of data here that we can extract. For instance, 
um, the women who were engaged in prostitution in Newark, they took 102 life histories of them. And we know that they had previously worked as factory hands, sale gir sales girls, stenographers, domestic workers, one school teacher. And we also learned something about the gendering of wages. Um, these women on average made $9 a week in their previous occupations. Working as prostitutes, they averaged $38.50 a week. Um, now, the vice investigators described them overall as ignorant, foolish, and easily led, but they, they disregarded the fact that there's an obvious economic imperative here driving the, the choices these women were making within pretty uh, tight conditions of patriarchy and capitalism. Sex work made a lot more sense than working in a factory for a great deal of these women. Um, and, and we can see a little bit of their voices uh, kind of seeping through the cracks of, of this report. So for instance, you know, we see this one young woman explaining to an investigator, um, I'm awful discontented with life. Uh, she doesn't really want to say more about it than that, but you know, we, we, it is a clear sort of existential um, declaration, maybe a tactical one to solicit his sympathy. That's also certainly possible, but you know, we can just get these fragments, these glimpses and glimmers of the subjectivities of these women. We can't really get more than that. Um, but for instance, here's another um, young woman who is, is basically making herself sexually available in, in this kind of somewhat delicate negotiation in which the investigator is pleading innocence about what she means by going to some place. She's saying, oh, don't be afraid to name it. I'm game, uh, sort of putting the ball in his court and, and forcing him to be the one to articulate what's going on here. Um, and we can get a sense of the sort of sophisticated strategies uh, that these women use to navigate a criminalized and illicit industry in this era. Um, you know, we can also see, I think, a really important theme here, which is that social hygiene programs uh, in Newark and everywhere were always also racial hygiene programs. You know, there, there is no separating uh, the moral regulation of sex work out from racial regulation in Newark. And we see that in the, the section in this report on the so-called Barbary Coast, which if you know Newark geography, kind of centered around uh, Kinney down off of uh, the Lincoln Park area, just south of, of downtown Newark. And, you know, using the, the antiquated terminology of the time, this is where they found the social evil conditions among the Negroes. And uh, you know, what we see is that sex work in Newark is unsurprisingly fairly racially segregated uh, and that the, the fairly overtly racist attitudes of these social reformers really seeps through and, and that's on somewhat ugly display in this next image that I'm going to present um, in which they, they describe these women who are working as prostitutes and they say this, in, you know, this is a quote, the danger of this is emphasized by the fact that the Negro prostitute is more careless of her physical condition than her white sister. This is obviously something that comes largely from the white supremacist imagination of these uh, social reformers and not from any uh, actual you know, substantive evidence, but, but it goes to show that, you know, racial stereotypes and racist stereotypes then figure into the ways that sex work is rendered legible within the middle class and, and white milieu that would be reading this report. Um, you know, I think that's an important principle to, to be very clear about in thinking about this history. Now, as we move through the 19 teens, one thing we see is that during World War I, uh, because the US War Department, the federal agency, is very concerned about keeping soldiers away from sex workers um, in, in the name primarily of preventing venereal disease, which they always blame on, on sex workers and never on the men who frequent them. Um, and so the, the War Department actually invites the Committee of 14, which is a longstanding um, anti-vice moral reform group, most based in New York City, to come over to New Jersey and basically put it under surveillance. And so during World War I, particularly 1917 and 1918, um, and this is coming from the, um, the internal files of the Committee of 14 at the New York Public Library on 42nd Street in, in Manhattan, um, what we see is that there is an abundance, dozens upon dozens of pages of, of these reports that these investigators file. Um, and again, I'm breezing through this. I don't ask anybody to try to read this whole thing on, on short notice here. I'm just using it for illustrative purposes. But, um, you know, you can see that one investigator um, in November of 1917 breezes into Newark, leaves New York at 5 p.m., gets here at 6 p.m., goes immediately to the Buyer's Cafe on Halsey Street, um, and begins surveilling women. Um, and they do this relentlessly. You can see this um, 
just uh, my head might be in the way, uh, depending on where I am on your monitor. But um, on, on Halloween night of 1918, uh, the, the vice regulators are out here in full force trying to monitor. And we can get a pretty good geography of public sex work in Newark from these reports. You know, the earlier one had mentioned Halsey Street. Here we're seeing some pickups around Broad and Market. It becomes pretty clear that downtown Newark um, is, is really the, the, you know, locus of this exchange as, as you know, probably would be um, expected. In fact, I'll, I'll jump ahead here. Whoops. Um, yeah, we can see one of the vice investigators even draws a map. Um, if you can't quite make that out, I believe it's, it's Market Street and Branford there going up to Washington. And he's documenting all of the spaces where he's um, surveilling sex work. Now, again, we, we can get a little glimmer of these women's subjectivities and, and the sort of ways that they render this work um, meaningful uh, to themselves, reading against the grain, of course, of these vice investigators who are not very sympathetic to them and who are always writing through lenses of the sexism and, and misogyny, um, for sure. But for instance, a young woman named Kitty here, um, who is, you know, soliciting the investigator who's undercover and, and explains to him um, that, uh, in her own words, uh, you might have gotten a little charity, but I am wiser now. Uh, and charity girls uh, are a source of big consternation to these investigators. They're considered promiscuous young women who are having sex without charging, uh, which they also see as very socially disruptive. And so this young woman, Kitty, says, you might have got a little charity, but I'm wiser now. I ain't going to give any of it away anymore. I was stung too often. Um, and again, it gives us some sense of the sort of transactional meaning of, of sex to some of these young women in a patriarchal society where you know, having sex for free uh, often became a source of exploitation for them. And, and so sex work simply made sense as a way of reallocating uh, the nature of those transactions uh, in ways that favor themselves more. And so, you know, again, there, there's some really rich insight here into the history of sex work, but always written from the oppressive force that is trying to criminalize these women, which is not you know, these vice investigators are not very sympathetic. You know, they want to make arrests. They want to um, eradicate sex work, but they don't do it in any kind of feminist context that might mean taking seriously those wage discrepancies that I mentioned. Um, you know, they know that women are, are doing this for economic reasons, and yet they never really address the root causes of that. They never suggest minimum wages for women or better jobs or, you know, more available jobs. And so, you know, that, that is the, um, you know, the problematic history of the regulation of sex work underway here in Newark. Now, whoops. You know, if, if you look at the literary history of Newark, it, it becomes clear that, that sex work is a, a real staple of Newark public culture. So for instance, Curtis Lucas, a really interesting um, novelist who wrote sort of lurid pulp novels in the mid 20th century, an African-American author, um, who wasn't from Newark originally, but did live here and spend a significant amount of time here in the 1940s. Um, Third Ward Newark is, is a really, um, you know, it's a, it's a cheap dime store pulp novel, but it's, it's written with remarkable sympathy to young women who um, become sex workers out of economic desperation. You know, in a lot of middle-class sentimental narratives of both um, Hollywood cinema and, and fiction, sex work is something that needs to be punished. Um, there's always a moralistic kind of ending. But in Third Ward Newark, we actually see um, at least one young woman who's one of the major characters working as a sex worker in her teenage years and then later becoming successful and having um, a fulfilling and happy life, which, which is a fairly radical um, kind of gloss on that narrative for the 1940s. And so, you know, a novel worth noting. And likewise, a few decades later, Nathan Hurd, um, who begins as an incarcerated novelist, he writes Howard Street from Trenton State Prison, uh, but then after it, it's published and, and he gets out, he teaches creative writing, among many other really fascinating kind of episodes in his life. But Howard Street, also set in the, the old Third Ward, um, is another book that has drug dealers and sex workers and is approached through a pretty sensationalized and, and grim lens, but, um, but not a moralistic one. You know, women and also men are, are not punished for sex work per se in this novel. It's simply seen as part of the necessities of economic life in an economically depressed community. Um, and one more interesting example, I don't think these are particularly famous novels, but there was a, the, a, a series of detective novels in the 1980s, the uh, Easy Barnes mystery novels. Um, 
they're not the greatest things ever written. I'll be honest. The uh, author Richard Hillary was a, was a pseudonym of, of two guys working together, but they do have a really interesting character in them named Angel. Um, and she's a Latina transgender sex worker. And if you read the early novels, she's treated in, in a pretty transphobic and, and really problematic way. She's often referred to as Angel the sex change uh, and, and he pronouns are used against her. Um, that's how the author describes her. But actually by the third novel, she's become one of the sort of heroic figures in this and the author has learned to respect her pronouns. And there's an interesting learning curve going on here as well as a somewhat under-recognized um, transgender sex worker uh, from Newark literary history that deserves a little bit of attention, I think. Um, now, this is a photo of uh, a man named John, uh, he, he preferred not to use his last name. Uh, we interviewed him for the Queer Newark Oral History Project. And, and John was an Irish Catholic uh, Newarker born in uh, 1938. And, and he offers one of the rare glimpses of male sex work in this history. You know, most, uh, most of the story I've been talking about has been women. Um, but John, as a young gay man, had basically a really, uh, a pretty robust sex life, particularly public sex around Newark from Penn Station to the old movie theaters to the city parks. Um, he, he was he was very much in the cruising life, but he also acknowledged that sometimes he would go to the, to the little theater, a theater I'll mention again uh, a little down the road here, when he was in high school. And, and this is how, this is what he said. These are John's wor words. Um, I do have memories of that. We sort of knew that being young, being high school kids and everything, that the older guys would probably want to have sex with us and they might give us some money. The contact was there. It was almost always made in the men's room. Although in the theater, you could walk around the theater and you knew that everybody in there was looking for something. If you were a, a high school kid and you were wearing tight Levi's, somebody was gonna approach you. Then you'd say, well, you weren't sure. You didn't know, you played the innocent game and they would offer you money. Um, now, John was not doing it out of economic desperation. He was really doing it for fun, turning tricks, um, you know, for, for his own sort of enjoyment and, and fulfillment. Uh, but it does offer one glimpse of mid-century male sex work. And I think there's a deeper history there that's pretty hard to access. Um, you know, it's pretty hard to document because it's so poorly archived, which is something that I'll be turning to momentarily. Um, and I apologize if I'm going fast. That's, that's the reason that I put the slides out. So hopefully... Um, anything anybody wants to go back to, you should have on hand. Um, now this, this is where I'll slow down for one second and say, one of the richest sources for both mid-century sex work and also as we move into the topic of gay bars here, um, again comes from a socially oppressive force. And that is the Alcoholic Beverage Control of New Jersey, which had its headquarters here in Newark and spent an enormous amount of time putting bars under surveillance for moral, moral offenses. Um, now for years and for decades, their reports were extraordinarily hard to access. There were only two places that I know of where you could find them. One was the State Library in Trenton and the other was Alexander Library uh, at Rutgers, New Brunswick. Um, there were not a lot of hard copies circulating, but just this year, I don't know if anybody followed this story, but the attorney, the state attorney general, um, attorney general Graywell before he left office, uh, basically acknowledged New Jersey's oppressive history of um, attacking gay bars and has had the alcoholic beverage controls uh, reports digitized and they're now much more available, much more searchable and an enormously rich resource. And so I've got a few examples here. And again, I'll sort of whisk through them for the sake of time um, with the encouragement to anybody who's interested in this to dig further. Um, so for instance, the 17 Club on, on William Street, we're here in 19, uh, the early 1950s. And again, we, we can get a glimpse of, of sex work. This young woman named Betty, um, who's charging $15. And we can see, for instance, um, little details of the negotiations of sex work. You know, she, she's demanding that he, he use a condom. She's asking whether he had any rubbers. Um, and, and, you know, in, in that way, marking her own boundaries and, and, you know, sort of making clear what she was willing to do and, and whatnot. Um, now, obviously, through the eyes of the state, this is the classic fallen woman and there's no sympathy for her in this report, but we can still you know, glean these kernels of, of insight into just the sort of texture of uh, her life as a sex worker here. Um, it's not all that we would hope for. We wish there'd be an oral history with Betty or a diary that she left behind, but the truth is as historians, these are the sort of kernels and fragments that we have to work with. Um, and, and in that sense, it does become a really valuable and rich resource even as it's very fragmentary and leaves a lot of questions unanswered. It leaves us wishing we could know more. 
Um, and, and it's through the alcoholic beverage control, really, that gay bars first become visible. Again, there's not a rich archive of mid-century LGBTQ life in Newark yet, although it's something we're working on building. And in the absence of that, these kind of governmental reports are, are rich with details. And so I'll linger on this one for one second. This is 135 Mulberry Street Corporation, um, which is the owner at this point of the bar Murphy's Tavern, which is going to figure pretty prominently in the story. And you can see at the top, the header, right? Discipli disciplinary proceedings, lewdness and immoral activities, permitting female impersonators and known persons of ill repute upon the licensed premises. And when they, when they dig into it, it becomes clear that they're using female impersonators in this fairly broad way to include effeminate reading gay men. Um, you know, again, these are anti-gay agents of the state who are not speaking in the language we would use today or even making distinctions we would make today. Um, but they give us, a, a, again, a fairly rich sense of some of the social interactions in this bar, Murphy's in Newark, right? So we can see that the patrons talked and laughed in high-pitched voices, walked in a manner most effeminate, sometimes on tiptoes, sometimes with a wiggle. They caressed themselves and each other, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one even used mascara and powder. Um, really, we get a little sense of the slang of the time. They're, they're referring to each other as she or sister, referring to other men as girlfriend. Um, you know, again, it's, 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 um, it's a matter of reading against the grain because the entire reason this document exists is in the service of destroying this bar. And yet it's almost the only documentation we have of what went on inside it. Um, and again, you know, moving kind of quickly here, we can see they, they make jokes um, uh, approaching one another, say, you look as if you are pregnant. The other says, maybe I am pregnant, pulling his shirt away from his body, creating a bulge, pointing to the first patron, maybe you are the mother. Um, well, another patron is wagging his finger saying, naughty, naughty. I mean, this is, you know, this is important material. It gives us a little bit of a sense of the social fabric of this world, the sort of catty in-jokes, the familiarity, the sense of intimacy, and even desire that's going on here, all because these creepy state agents are spying on them. Um, and, and again, there, there's a variety, a, a wealth of these reports. I'll give a couple more examples. Um, the Polka Club on Springfield Avenue, um, again, we're in the mid-1950s here, and this is using some offensive and archaic language, which is something you can't avoid when looking at these reports. Um, but here we have the Autumn Jamboree, uh, which is being framed as a, quote, faggy show. Um, but it's clear that, it, you know, this is a glimpse of an early trans community of female impersonators, um, you know, possibly transsexuals would have been the language of that era. It's not entirely clear, you know, who these people are and exactly what the meaning of gender is to them individually or the meaning of these performances, but it's clearly a space of queer performance and community and, and gender bending, um, which of course the state cracks down on because that is not acceptable in Newark or New Jersey at this point. Um, a few more examples, I mean, and again, there's a variety of these. I'll say one quick word about that at the end. The hub bar on Mulberry Street, um, again, has homosexuals on premises. And this one I find particularly insightful because it gives us a whole paragraph here on this character, Francie, a quote male known as the Belle of Mulberry Street. Um, and we get a sense that Francie, who probably would have used female pronouns, although, you know, is going to be referred to in male pronouns by the state's dictates here, um, is clearly flirtatious and sort of, um, you know, flaunting and, and, and delighting in her gender performance um, and also seeking sex. Um, you know, here's somebody who's expressing queer desire. Um, expressing the desire to uh, engage in an act of sexual perversion, as the state says. And of course, that's going to be used against her and against the bar to have it closed down as a haven for homosexuals, again, in the language of the state. Um, and, you know, I think Francie is somebody that we can't, pro probably can't know much more about than this glimpse, but it does give us a glimpse of queer desire and queer resistance. Um, and there's something you know, there's something heroic, I think, in, in this glimmer of somebody who is going to live her life on her terms, um, no matter what these state agents tried to do or tried to destroy. Um, 
and and you know men are overrepresented in all of this public the public sphere historically has been gendered has obviously allowed more mobility and public visibility for men uh but there are glimpses of, of early lesbian culture as well and and so the um the latin quarter on pennington street um is is a site where again we get a glimpse of uh lesbians hanging out and dancing together um, uh, you know, not sufficiently female attired for these state agents who are basically defining them as lesbians by the fact that they look insufficiently feminine. Um, and, and so again, this becomes incredibly valuable in the absence of other documentation of, of lesbian life in mid-century Newark. And one quick word I'll say about that, there is a fantastic essay coming out um, in hopefully next year. I'm editing a book called Queer Newark for Rutgers University Press and the historian Anna Lavovsky um, who I'll hold this up in front of the camera. She, she wrote this great book just published, um, Vice Patrol, uh, Cops, Courts, and the Struggle Over Urban Gay Life Before Stonewall. Uh, she has a fantastic essay that digs really deeply into these alcoholic beverage control records and you know, to a, to a degree well beyond what anybody else has done yet, recreates this world of gay and lesbian nightlife. Um, so I'm really excited about that coming out next year. And I think anybody who's interested in this will, will really want to read that as well. Um, and, and during this period, we, we do see other kinds of queer expression come through Newark. So for instance, the Jewel Box Review is a touring show. Um, and you can see here, it's playing at RKO Proctor's uh, Theater in downtown Newark. Um, and, and so there's a sense in which queerness is a visible part of Newark's urban life. Um, the state is trying to suppress it, but this is also advertised in the, in the, uh, the Newark Evening News. Um, you know, there's a weird contradiction here in which this is both a publicly visible form of queerness at the same time that the state is, is trying to destroy uh, the social base of queer life. Um, and, and also I had to cram this in, it doesn't fit very, um, very continuously with what I'm talking about, but Newark also becomes a, a real hub of uh, burlesque during this era. And uh, this is a really fascinating moment in uh, 1954, it is, this is in uh, Time Magazine, where Minsky's um, on, on Branford Place uh, draws a class from uh, New York City's New School for Social Research uh, over for a visit to uh, examine basically what's going on with burlesque culture. And in this article, the professor says that he had made a terrible mistake and forgotten how low burlesque had sunk, but the 21-year-old performer here um, has her own voice and, and she uh, disagrees with his assessment that burlesque was a joyless corruption. And she says, it's not dead for me. I own my own house in Gardenia, California, and I have a car all paid for. I'm doing all that and I'm just 21. I think I'm doing all right. Um, and so just you know, one more example, I think of the, the sort of glimmers we can get of some of the, you know, the, the workers within sex industries having a voice uh, and pushing that voice through even within a, even within a, a ma mainstream magazine like Time. Um, and the story of burlesque in Newark is actually probably beyond my scope here, but a really interesting one because New York City cracks down on burlesque in the 1930s and 40s, and a good portion of it migrates to Newark, which becomes a burlesque hub until the 1950s when New Jersey uh, initiates its own crackdown and basically drives burlesque out of, out of Newark as well. Um, so there's not a lot of visual evidence. As you've seen, I've been showing a lot of slides of text, right? Because there just aren't that many images for, uh, documenting this era, but there are a few good ones. Um, and this is from the Berg photos at Newark Public Library, um, right off the corner here of uh, Edison and Mulberry. And you can see there on the right, Murphy's Tavern, the bar that I had mentioned uh, that was under surveillance in 1950. I think I should lead into a close up here. Yeah, um, you know, you can see it's a fairly nondescript venue and, and yet this photo takes on enormous historical significance just because it's the only photo I know of, of Murphy's in this era. And amazingly, if you pan your eye across the street, you can also see in that same photo, the hub bar that I had also mentioned. And, and so it becomes clear that Mulberry and Edison is one real hub of that wasn't even an intended pun, sorry, but um, you know, one one hub of gay life in in Newark and gay nightlife in the mid twentieth century, and um, you know, as Anna Lavovsky documents in that essay I mentioned, there there's also a succession of other bars clustered right around here, and and so it's pretty clear that this is one geographical locus of of queer community in mid century Newark. Now, I have to make a long story short here for the sake of time, but essentially. 
after decades of this alcoholic beverage control surveillance and monitoring and having licenses uh, taken away from bars that allowed gay people to hang out, Murphy's, uh, which I just showed, became part of a court case along with two other bars um, from New Brunswick and Atlantic City that, in a case that challenged the alcoholic beverage control, went all the way to the New Jersey State Supreme Court and won um, a real landmark in LGBT legal history here in New Jersey in 1967. Now, again, this is two years before the famous Stonewall Rebellion of New York City, which a lot of people mistakenly date as the beginning of gay rights in America. Um, you know, it's not. And the Murphy's case, I think, really shows the, the longer trail of legal resistance and community resistance. And what the what the New Jersey State Supreme Court decides is that the alcoholic beverage control can't crack down on bars and revoke their license simply for allowing homosexual people, which is the language it uses at the time, uh, to congregate. But it does restrict those congregations to what it calls, quote, well-behaved homosexuals. Um, and so that's a little bit of a legal gray zone. It's not immediate liberation here because by the standards of 1967, kissing and dancing, things like that, would obviously not be considered well-behaved. And so, you know, this is not a liberatory victory that ends homophobic regulation, but it absolutely knocks the legs out of some of this kind of spying um, from the state. And, and it does open the door to a proliferation of more openly gay bars and nightclubs in Newark. So for instance, um, people coming out of the fashion world, like Albert Murphy um, and Daryl Rochester, uh, two, two really important figures here in the 1970s, Black gay men who helped kind of cultivate uh, gay community in Newark, you know, they're already building community and, and doing these fashion shows and things like that. And they're, they're very central in building um, clubs like Les Jacques, uh, of which we have almost no photographic documentation, but which is on Halsey Street in the 1970s and, and is this um, somewhat I mean, incredibly kind of hip and fashionable um, gay gay nightclub. Um, we, we, we see places like The Other World uh, in, in North Newark. Um, this ad is from 1975. And if you can't read it, it says dance contest Friday nights, uh, two floors of live disco music, a light show, a waterbed, and it is New Jersey's gayest gay bar. Um, we don't know a lot about The Other World, but we do know that uh, James Creedle, a really important figure in the LGBTQ movement here in Newark, who worked at Rutgers Newark and was one of the first openly gay administrators uh, at Rutgers Newark, he, he told a story about going to the other world as a black gay man with a white male partner and their car was shot at by locals. Um, and, and you know, this is in North Newark, uh, as, as James recounted it in his story, he called it Imperiali County, which it was. And so it was never completely clear whether it was homophobia, racism, or most likely both that led to that incident. Um, but you know, it's, it's another moment that, that really necessitates thinking critically along intersectional axes about LGBTQ history in Newark, where a space that was relatively inviting for white gay men um, was very much less so for a black gay man in the 1970s. Um, but nightlife downtown in Newark did cater to more of a black gay crowd. And we can see places like SRO, um, also on Halsey Street, popping up in the early 1980s. Um, this is uh, me with um, Craig Blunt and Pucci Revlon. Pucci was um, an absolutely remarkable transgender woman in Newark who shared her life story with us at the Queer Newark Oral, Oral History Project as she was dealing with terminal cancer, which ultimately took her life. Um, and, and it's just, it's so powerful that, you know, she knew the importance of recording her life history as a trans woman. Um, and, and Pucci told these amazing stories about bars that are very poorly documented. Um, and, and so one of her stories, my favorite one, was about a place called the Doll House down off of Halsey and Branford um, above the jazz club Sparky Jays. And uh, at the Doll House, she said, we did drag shows, we did plays as well. Um, we roller skated around and they did uh, a roller skate rendition of The Wiz. Um, they also did a play called Is My Family Turning Gay? Um, which was a, it sounds like a satirical play about a, a straight couple concerned about their children turning gay, but then everybody turns gay. Um, and there's no record of these. There's no scripts, there's no video, there's no photos. They really only live on in these oral histories. Um, 
but clearly speaking to a, a really thriving downtown queer nightlife scene um, in the 1970s that was also trans inclusive, at least to, a, to an extent. Um, and, you know, some other clubs in the Ironbound, um, we see places like the Cactus Club, which catered to more of a, a sort of white clone culture, I think, uh, my general impression from what I've heard and from the, uh, the flyer. Um, we see places like uh, the Club Bath, which is a, a national chain, but there's one on Broadway here in Newark, a bathhouse um, that served primarily gay men. And one of uh, the most fascinating uh, interviews I've ever conducted with the Queer Newark Oral History Project is with Ruby Rams, um, who is a, is a drag performer from Newark. And she performed at both The Other World that I mentioned and, and also The Bathhouse. Um, and, and she had some great stories about, um, well, for one thing, at The Other World, she rode a horse on stage for, for, to make a grand entrance, but then the horse proceeded to defecate on stage uh, thereby clearing out the whole club, um, which uh, she told in a, you know, very humorous manner. Um, but anyway, you know, we can get a glimpse of this kind of rambunctious, kind of sexualized, you know, again, gender bending culture of Newark in the 1970s that goes from downtown, you know, even stretching up, up Broadway toward uh, the, the North Ward. Now, I, I realize I, I had promised to only speak for 45 minutes and I'm barely getting into the topic of pornography in Newark which um, as an academic is really what I write about. Fortunately, I can really zip through this um, in, in an almost cinematic montage is what I had in mind here, rather than really laying any of these out. Just to give you a sense, clearly Newark is a hotbed of pornography in the mid 20th century. Here's 50,000 books seized. Um, here's a book dealer arrested. Uh, here's an international smut photo ring of couples, probably swingers who are trading explicit photos um, through a place based in Newark. Uh, police director Spina called them depraved minds um, and tried to crush the organization. Um, again, a lot of photo ops for the authorities. They loved to do smut raids because then they could pose looking very dignified and moral um, with the uh, perverted material that they had seized. Um, even pornographic records, audio recordings of uh, presumably heavy breathing and, and moaning oriented kinds of shows from nightclubs. Um, again, I got carried away here because I, I think these images are kind of compelling, but um, here we have Essex County Sheriff closely examining these smut reels that he seized. Um, little known fact, we, we also had um, a gay physique uh, publication based here in Newark in the early 1960s, Art Modern. Um, of, you know, strapping young men posed quite erotically and scantily clad. Um, I, I know very little about it. That, this is from the one gay and lesbian archives in Los Angeles. And this is basically the only document they have for art modern. So um, again, a sort of fragment of a history that would be fascinating to know more about, but clearly there was a sort of gay erotic culture, you know, emanating out of Newark here, or at least using a post office box in Newark. Um, and we also had the Legion of Decency, the Catholic organization monitoring all of this. Um, their records are at Seton Hall and a rich, rich repository of these kinds of reports of Father Hayes, for instance, surveilling um, in this particular case, um, student nurses uh, who are hanging out at St. Michael's because they've been patronizing a store where there's pornographic material available, as well as a cook who is a homosexual. Um, and so we get a sense, again, of both the, the forces committed to destroying this, these underground worlds, but also the ways in which they then document these very worlds that they uh, seek to uh, eradicate. And uh, Father uh, Reverend Hayes sent fawning uh, letters to J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, who warmly responded in the late 1950s, telling him that he was deeply grateful for his interest thanking him for his generous remarks. So we can get a sense here too of the kind of networks of social power that are being harnessed. Um, of course, J. Edgar Hoover sent a lot of these generic form letters, but it still shows that there, there's a back and forth going on. Um, this is too amazing not to show. The, uh, the diocese uh, in, in Newark also published this pamphlet, Five Reasons Printed Filth Continues to Grow in Our Midst. Um, and those five reasons are lax parents, big profits, ultra-liberalism, apathy. Um, I'll sit on this for just one second so people can take it in. And again, you know, you can come back to these slides anytime. And, and I encourage you to really uh, dig into them 
in more detail. And of course, ultimately, these liberal court authorities who are tying the hands of the authorities who want to help. Um, just kind of a remarkable local uh, little publication that gives some sense of the anti-porn politics that the church in particular is advocating um, and, and the sort of logic and analysis that they're offering of, of pornography in the mid 20th century. Now, the final chapter of what I wanted to say here, and I will race through this, I promise, because I want there to be time for questions as well. Um, the Little Theater in downtown Newark is an absolutely fascinating institution. I think it's something I've written a, a great deal about. Um, and so I'll try to go move fast here uh, and people can come back and read that later, maybe if they want to. But this is pr almost certainly Newark's longest running movie theater. It, it began, um, it was constructed in the late 1920s. You can see here um, an artist's illustration that appeared. Um, this, this is from Philip Reed's Movie Houses of Greater Newark book, which I absolutely love and, and recommend to anybody. Um, this is from digging into the Newark Evening News in 1928. You can see that, you know, it was heralded as this um, movie theater house that was going to uh, show smaller movies for specific ethnic crowds. And so it showed films in German, films in Yiddish um, for German and, and Jewish immigrants in particular. By the mid 20th century, it sort of shifted into a classic grindhouse model showing sleazy movies like The Flesh Merchant. Um, in fact, young Philip Roth, who is probably Newark's one of Newark's most famous um, literary figures. As a boy, he snuck in to see uh, Hedy Lamarr in, in Ecstasy, the famous movie with um, a little bit of nudity. And uh, for him, it was a very formative experience. The way he recounted it was more or less moaning at the screen. He said, this is it, this is it. Um, and so we can think of the little theater as something that in some ways informed the um, very sexualized career of, of Philip Roth for, for better and or possibly for worse. Um, Moving through the 60s, it, it shows grindhouse sexploitation movies like Body of a Female, which is now a lost movie that you can't see. Um, I desperately wish we could because it's the first film of Roberta Finley, the young woman pictured there. Um, I'm co-editing a book about her right now. She later becomes a pioneering female pornographer and is a really fascinating figure. But in 1964 in Newark, you could have seen her on the big screen at the Little Theater. Um, I got carried away here, but in, in 1967, during the rebellion, um, when downtown Newark was deserted, as the, the Newark News reported, the movie theaters actually stayed open. And so during the Newark rebellion or, or riots, if you will, um, you could have gone to the Little Theater to see a, an obscure film called Sweet Skin, actually starring um, the singer Nico from the Velvet Underground. Uh, so an interesting film culture here. By 1968, you could, you know, your choices locally were 2001 A Space Odyssey, Ingmar Bergman, or you could go to the Little Theater and watch a film called Excited. Um, and so the, the Little Theater, you know, carries on this pornographic tradition into the 70s, into the 80s, into the 21st century. Um, you know, as you can see, a sort of fixture of the downtown landscape here with a little bit of skyline and church in the background. Um, if you were to go into the Little Theater, basically what you would see is a hallway that you had to walk through, um, an archaic uh, advertisement for adult videos, uh, many decades old by, by the time it closed, um, a, a Frogger and Ms. Pac-Man video game, um, and, and then a 300-seat movie theater, as well as a smaller theater upstairs that, that showed uh, all-male content. Um, I did get a tour of the theater from its owner, Danny Ganota, before he passed away. Um, the old 35-millimeter projector was no longer in use. They were showing uh, on, on digital only at that point, but Basically, you know, why, why am I lingering on the Little Theater? What's its importance, you know, as an historian? I, I would say this, and then I'll wrap up on this note. Um, you know, by 1990, the, the Little Theater and the Cameo, which is also an adult movie theater, are literally the only movie theaters in Newark. Uh, you can see here the movie listings from, uh, I think this is August of 1990, when you could watch Total Recall or Arachnophobia, Warren Beatty and Madonna and Dick Tracy all at the movie theaters in Maplewood and Montclair. But the listing for Newark, the movie listings in the Star Ledger is nothing but the cameo in the little theater. And so in some ways, porn theaters kept cinema alive in, in Newark during um, some socioeconomically grim years when there were no movie theaters here. But more than that, I would say it's also a site for the congregating of sexual minority communities. Um, you can find online testimony from a trans woman named Sophia who credits it with playing a pivotal role in my training and development as a sissy. Um, she would hang out there and, and cruise. Um, the Brotherhood of Leathermen of Color um, organized an outing to the Little Theater in 2011. 
Um, and again, you know, you, you, you could brush all of this off and you could say that this is not important and these are fringe and marginal groups. But as an historian of sexuality, I would argue that a place like the Little Theater is one of the few sites where these, you know, marginalized sexual communities could, um, you know, live their own truths and live their own communities, as well as obviously men cruising for sex, which was the dominant majority of uh, the demographic who, who attended there. And, and it gives a glimpse of a, of a somewhat different sexual public sphere than the one that we live in now in the era of gentrification and neoliberalism and hyperdevelopment, where these kind of public sites are, are disappearing. Um, you know, sex itself obviously continues in a whole variety of often tech mediated ways, but that particular physical public sphere, uh, you know, is a relic of an earlier era. And the Little Theater is one of the institutions that carried it the furthest in Newark. It, it didn't close until 2018. Um, and, and, you know, it's one of the longest running porn theaters in this entire region. And so by way of wrapping up, um, oh, and it's commemorated all over the place as well, um, maybe accidentally, I'm not sure, but this big mural on the back of the building over at Broad and Lackawanna, um, you can see Audible and Rutgers in the background. The little theater is very visible there, right in the center of this classical um, scope of Newark movie theaters. Um, in the old version of the Gateway Center in 2017, there was this great animatronics um, sort of exhibit about Newark, um, really strange and interesting public art project. And when I was walking by it, I, I noticed the little theater was commemorated there as well. Um, and so it's sort of peppered across, um, you know, sort of public memory in Newark, but I think needs to be recognized as a space of sexual minorities um, and, and this, who, who fought for community here, you know, into, um, into the Obama era, really into the Trump era even. Um, and then, so let me say one, one quick wrap up about all of this, and then I'll turn it over back to George. Um, what can you do? If you're interested in this history, I, I do want to offer some suggestions. If, if you're convinced that this is an important history um, that deserves to be documented and, and valued as part of New York's history, one thing is uh, Murphy's Tavern, and this is one of the only other photo of it I know, um, deserves an historical marker, I think. You know, it won a landmark case for gay rights in 1967. Um, it's, it's, you know, you can see, if anybody knows Newark, this is the space right across from the Prudential Arena. There's literally nothing there right now. It's a big blank block with a big stupid hockey statue um, and almost nothing else in that entire city block. It's a perfect place for an historical marker. So, you know, if you're interested in historical preservation and preserving memory, um, anywhere and anywhere that you can, advocate for that. Um, I would love to see op-eds and letters to the editor calling for that. In Atlantic City, they're, they're getting an historical marker um, related to the alcoholic beverage control oppression, and, and we deserve one here in Newark as well. If you care about LGBTQ history, support local organizations like the Newark LGBTQ Community Center. In fact, um, this is tomorrow, the virtual Halloween drag bingo fundraiser show with the amazing Harmonica Sunbeam, um, who's carrying on some of this legacy of gender bending and gender nonconformity here in our own city. Um, I would love for people to go out and support that. It's a fantastic organization. Full disclosure, I spent several years on the board of it, but I'm not, um, my, my term ended, so I'm no longer officially affiliated. Support the AAOGC, the African American Office of Gay Concerns, which has done incredible wonders to fight the AIDS epidemic here in Newark. Um, as well as to celebrate queer and trans identity um, and is just uh, just an amazing organization whose director, Gary Paul Wright, I absolutely love and respect deeply. Um, finally, if, if you thought that my telling of these 19 teen stories about sort of surveilling and oppressing sex workers was ancient history, it's not. Um, under Mayor Baraka, we've continued that legacy of arresting sex workers and criminalizing them. I, I cropped this to spare these demeaning photos that were published in 2017. But you can see that as recently as a few years ago, six transgender women arrested in Newark prostitution ring, framed of course as bizarre by a sensationalistic press. Um, the criminalization of sex work hurts sex workers. And that's not me as a, as a white historian saying that, that's me echoing the voice of sex worker rights organizations. And so the final thing I wanna say is if, if you share those politics, support organizations like the New Jersey Red Umbrella Alliance, which is the pioneering uh, sex workers rights organization here in New Jersey, which has been fighting for decriminalization of sex work for years, along with the ACLU of New Jersey, which has done remarkable work on here and I think deserves a lot of credit. And so 
I think that's the closing thing I want to say. I really do want it to be a call to action. Um, you know, email Mayor Baraka, email Governor Murphy, let them know that, you know, if, if you're convinced that arresting people for being sex workers is not socially productive, they, they should know that and they should hear that. Um, and I really hope people will join that movement for decriminalization and sex workers' rights. Um, so on that note, if anybody ever wants to get in touch, you know, here's my email. Um, I'm on Twitter. I mostly just ranch there and post pictures of cats. Um, and I've written, I, I've got a cheesy blog, but I've, uh, a lot of this comes from a series I wrote about pornography in Newark. And so you can check out more there if you're interested. But with that being said, I will, um, I will shut myself up and turn things over to George. And, and thanks everybody for attending. Uh, I hope that you found this enlightening and enjoyable. You know, yeah, please don't shut up because <laughs> we have a lot of questions for you. And it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, and very enlightening talk. And I really want to say as a historian, I really appreciate how much during your talk you highlighted historical sources uh, that are available for, for doing this history and the, the sorts of uh, resources that you drew upon, uh, as well as uh, sort of showing the geography of sex work and the geography of vice in Newark. And for example, I, well, I didn't realize the other world, that's just a couple of blocks from where I live. <laughs> I just, you know, so I, that's, I, that's uh, really makes me think about this neighborhood in a different way. Um, so uh, yeah, we've got, we've got some questions and I say to everyone who, who asks questions for WIT, uh, type them into the Q&A function um, and uh, we can go through some of them. So Jeff Johnson has a question. Uh, is the report you have been showing us on sex workers in Newark circa 1913 or so available in electronic format somewhere? Yeah, it, great question. It, it should be. Um, at least at one point it was through the Hathi Trust. Um, and if I'm able to multitask here, I'll see if I can pull it up. But it, it should be available as a PDF. Um, and if you can't find it, I have my own copy of a PDF. And so I'm happy to share that with anyone if you want to reach out to me if you can't find it online. Yeah, you know, I was interested. I, I think that's a fascinating, um, that's a fascinating document. And um, do you, you know, when they talk about various bars and places where prostitutes hung out, they always redacted the addresses. They never gave the specific addresses or the names of the bars. Do you know if there's any place where those are? So, oh, you mean the, the yeah, the blanked out spots. Um, I'm not certain about this, but I, I think that most likely, th this report came out of work from the American Vigilance Committee, which was a subsidiary of the American Social Hygiene Association. Um, and their re records are at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. I, I assume that there's, you know, internal archival documentation there. I've never had a chance to look at that myself, and it's probably beyond the scope of anything I would do. So, yeah, if anybody wants to take that ball and run with it, I suspect there's more there, but I'm not certain. Yeah, I, I was just curious about that. I know sometimes these vice reports, they wouldn't put the addresses in because they were afraid that people would read them and actually use it as a kind of, like a guy, oh, look, where can I go find prostitutes? Um, yeah, right, yeah, so no, let's see. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so Diane Ridley asks, uh, uh, queer was bad, now it's good, why? The, the term, queer, queer. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good question. Um, and it's a big question. I mean, I think the shortest version of it that I would offer, and this is something, I mean, I could, I think we could talk about for hours, but I think the shortest version is that, that you know, queer was historically a slur and an epithet, right? But in the 1980s, uh, it, it was sort of reclaimed by, by early activist groups like Queer Nation. Um, and that came out of radical AIDS activism, which essentially was very deliberately confrontational to homophobia in the 1990s. And one of the ways that it was confrontational, you know, with slogans like, we're here, we're queer, get used to it, what was basically, you know, taking these harmful terms that had historically been used to oppress LGBT people and, and inverting the meaning of them into sort of an, a radical affirmation of identity that sort of threw it back in the face of homophobes and, you know, a sort of anti-closet kind of rhetoric. Um, and then again, I, I think that's, that's only touching the tip of the iceberg of a long story of an academic field that emerges called queer theory. Um, but, but I think the short version is basically that, that it, it was reclaimed as radical AIDS activist um, work in the 1980s and, and then sort of stuck. Yeah, Bill, Bill May has a, a question, a comment question. Um, the two Negro prostitution areas mentioned, Barbary Coast and Brantford Place slash Broaden Market, both were, th were within yards of prestigious churches, mostly attended by non-Blacks. In your research, did you come across any complaints from the members or ministers of these churches? 
If so, please share some of your findings. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I, the answer is no, I, I didn't. I mean, I, I would agree that it's almost unthinkable that there weren't complaints of some sort, you know, whether they were written down or, or just verbalized or contained in sermons. You know, I, I don't know. I don't have any evidence of that, but I haven't seen any. But yeah, it would boggle the mind, you know, if there were not some sort of overt acknowledgement and grievance against it, unless it was something that was passed over in silence as, as a method of, you know, not calling attention to it. Um, that's possible, you know, that respectability politics could have dictated a certain strategic silence. Um, I'd love to know more, though. I would love for somebody to take that question and dig further. I'm sorry that I don't have a concrete answer there. Sure, sure. Um, uh, uh, Thayen Bretis de Arroyo asks, uh, says, this has been wonderful. Have you ever encountered historical mentions of feminist and or temperance movements on sex work in, in Newark? I mean, I guess crusades against, I suppose. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I mean, again, um, yeah, I'm sorry that I probably don't have much to add there beyond that, that I would expect that to be part of the rhetoric. I mean, certainly at the national level, groups like the Women's Christian Temperance Union um, were definitely, you know, involved in anti-sex work kind of politics. Um, so yeah, sorry that I don't have a great smoking gun answer. I would, I would expect that to be present here uh, at the Newark level, but I haven't personally seen it, sorry. Okay. Um, Neil Jackson asks, was there a heavy organized crime element as far as the ownership of movie theaters, bars, clubs, etc.? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I, you have to assume the answer is yes, because especially by the 1970s, when hardcore pornography crosses over into the mainstream and is playing at, you know, not only the Little Theater, but the Treat Theater um, in, in Newark as well, you know, organized crime unquestionably played a central role in the emergence of the hardcore industry. Um, even though it was mostly conservatives who were highlighting that at the time, you know, we have to acknowledge that they were right about that. Now, that being said, that's, it's a hard history to document, right? So there are these federal investigations in the 1970s, things like my porn, um, MI that is, um, coming out of Miami, uh, which is a long running federal sting operation. But, um, you know, I don't know of any hard evidence about Newark. Now, I did ask, so Danny Ganota, who owned and ran the Little Theater from 1966 until his death in... 2018, I did ask him, I was like, look, it's pretty obvious that organized crime was involved in the porn industry. So what about the little theater? And, you know, he flat out denied it, you know, whether he was sort of winking at me, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, what was he going to say? Yeah, I was working with the mob. I mean, that's not an easy thing. It's not an easy position to put somebody in, um, especially on the record, because I was writing about this for, for Vice magazine. Um, so, so I would assume, I mean, it's, you know, almost certain that there was a connection there. Part and also, of course, Newark has long, you know, underworld um, and political connections where, you know, the mafia and, and local politics intersect quite quite deeply. But um, but it's hard to document. So I, I don't. Yeah, sorry that I'm kind of saying this to all three questions here in a row. But yeah, I don't have good smoking gun evidence on that. Um, but I think we can safely assume that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bill may ask another question about um, how much information you have on Curtis Lucas. Um, he said that he discovered he was a member of one of New York's leading African-American churches. He served as a Sunday school teacher and as a deacon and trustee, uh, members of the board of trustees. Just wondered if you had it, what, what additional information, if any, you might have. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I, I mean, to be honest, not much. I, I've actually, I've been wishing people had written more about him. I mean, there are a few short scholarly accounts in um, like African-American writer biography books um, that are kind of short Wikipedia level descriptions, but I don't think he's gotten the attention he deserves. And I, I don't know a great deal more. I will say, forgive the awkwardness of me lurching around on camera here. Um, I think I have right here. Yeah, I've got, um, yeah, like I said, sorry for the awkward move, but um, I've got, a, I've got okay. some of his novels, um, for, Forbidden Fruit, um, Lila, um, Angel, you know, he was very interested in interracial romance and sex, as is obvious even just from the, the covers of those books. And most of his novels were not set in Newark. Um, but yeah, I don't know a great deal beyond that. And I would love for somebody, I mean, for somebody who's writing a, mas a master's thesis on, you know, Black pulp fiction history. I mean, I think there's, there's something here worth digging further into, and I'm not the one for it. So I'm happy to share <laughs> anything I come up with with anybody who does work on that. Yeah, I have a copy of that book of his on Third Word Newark. I haven't read it yet, but um, uh, yeah, a lot of pulp novels did exploit uh, interracial relationships. But yeah, it'd be interesting to, to know more about him for sure. 
Uh, Jonathan S. S. asks, do you think that gay nightlife establishments will return to Newark? You know, that's a really good question. I mean, that's obviously been a problem in LGBTQ nightlife everywhere, you know, even before the pandemic, um, you know, in places like Philadelphia, even, even New York City, right? I mean, lesbian bars have, have been hit the hardest, obviously. I mean, there, there's still, you know, not equity in the socioeconomics of, of gay bars. And, you know, in Philadelphia, I remember the last lesbian bar there closed, but I mean, then reopened, um, but, but it's been precarious. And so, you know, in, in, in Newark, we did, you know, all of the gay bars closed and then the Twister Lounge in the Ironbound opened for a few years, but was wiped out by COVID. Um, you know, they closed at the start of the pandemic and that became permanent. Um, and, you know, I think this is one of the challenges that, that we face here, right? I mean, kind of kind of what I was trying to allude to with the little theater, but I think you could extrapolate that to, you know, LGBTQ clubs as well, that, you know, as downtown develops and gentrifies, it becomes unaffordable and the sort of easily accessible spaces that once hosted these kind of venues, uh, you know, become harder and harder to sustain financially. Um, so, I mean, I would, I would love for that. I think that's an important, you know, I think it is important to have those kind of cultural institutions, but the way that economic trends are moving, it's hard for me to be optimistic either. Um, you know, frankly, I think that's why we need, you know, sort of leftist and, and socialist pushes for a more equitable distribution of wealth and also development in our society and, and here in Newark. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's, I think those are excellent points. And I guess, you know, so much, um, you know, a lot of gay bars have struggled to deal with, um, so much has been replaced by, you know, online stuff and people hooking up and meeting online chat rooms and things like that. So different new technologies. Um, Brian Hanlon has a comment. It pleases me so much that Ruby Rims is still around and has been interviewed. I started going to the other world in 1973 and later to the Cactus Club and a few bars in East Orange. So. Oh my God, we'd, we'd love to interview you at the Queer Newark Oral History Project, by the way. Um, I mean, that, you know, yeah, Ruby is, is wonderful and was so generous in, in recording an oral history, which isn't actually posted yet, but should be soon. Um, but yeah, no, those experiences, we, we'd love to record them. Um, and people can use their real names or be anonymous um, or use chosen names, whatever, whatever you like. So um, yeah, if you're willing to do that, please drop a line. Great. Yeah, this is great. It's a, a, this is a good uh, uh, reference, a resource for people to be able to uh, connect. And I also say, you know, if people who are attending this talk tonight, and if you're not a member of the Newark History Society, um, you know, we'd welcome you to join. And, um, you know, you can be a, a dues paying member. It only costs $25 a year. But even if you don't want uh, to, to, to do that. If you just give us your name, we'll put you on our membership list and send you out email blasts about talks and things like that. So um, yeah, so um, that's um, hopefully this can be beginning of new kinds of conversations. And uh, I already have a great idea for an, a talk on the whole burlesque situation, right? That you you alluded to and talked about and the, you know, the burlesque theaters in Newark. I think that'd be a wonderful, a wonderful talk for somebody to give. So, um, all right, well, I think we were kind of at the end of our night. I really fantastically attended lecture. Uh, I know a lot of us are all Zoomed out, you know, it's been Zoom this and Zoom that. So, I mean, this is a fantastic attendance and let's hope, you know, I know that uh, come spring, we're gonna be trying to get together in person, not only at NJPAC, but some of our other venues. So I look forward to seeing people in person. Uh, after a long time. And I really want to thank you, Whit, for such a great, uh, great and illuminating talk. And thank everyone for uh, attending and for your uh, comments and for your questions. So uh, we'll, uh, we've got several other programs this year, uh, the, uh, the Newark um, History Society, and um, hope to see people, uh, people at them. So good night and thanks.